Well, hello everybody. I think it's uh, just a great pleasure for me uh, to lecture to you because it's not that often that uh, the Russian professor is able to do such kind of job. And, uh, well, I think for me it's really a big, big challenge to be here with uh, the American students because, of course, normally I'm uh, teaching to Russian students and Russian students are a little bit different <laughs> to American students, but I will tell you uh, later, I think, about that. So a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I graduated from St. Petersburg State University. Uh, the School of Economics, and then afterwards uh, I had the possibility to uh, make my uh, PhD studies at uh, Moscow University of uh, World Economy and International Relations, and then I started to teach in St. Petersburg State uh, University, and uh, I was, uh, at that time, I was teaching the political economy of modern capitalism. Uh, because it was the period before our transition. And uh, afterwards, uh, the transition period started, and uh, we were supposed, as uh, the teachers, you know, to start to teach absolutely different uh, disciplines. And I think I was really quite lucky because I was uh, selected uh, among the first group of uh, teachers who went to study abroad. Uh, as uh, the uh, uh, teachers uh, for special MBA courses. Uh, and I was, uh, the first time I was in Business University Bocconi in Milano in Italy. That was uh, 1991. And then in 93, I was uh, at Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. It was also a special program for half a year, and then uh, I was in Barcelona in Spain in '96, and then I was uh, at uh, the Copenhagen Business School uh, in Denmark. So quite a lot of international uh, training in order to make it possible for me uh, lecturing in Russia uh, for our students and to teach absolutely new subjects for us. It was economics, uh, micro and macroeconomics, it was marketing, it was uh, also the uh, international marketing, and uh, I'm also lecturing in such subjects as uh, a theory of the firm and uh, marketing of services and international marketing and micro and macroeconomics and active methods of teaching. So a lot of, of uh, subjects. But that was uh, possible for me after such kind of training because uh, otherwise uh, it was um, quite difficult for uh, most of our teachers to start to teach uh, new uh, disciplines uh, because uh, of uh, the uh, a certain lack of the literature uh, because we didn't have at the very beginning that we didn't have the uh, textbooks in Russian language uh, we didn't have uh, the textbooks in English uh, but now we are having for instance translations of uh, uh, Fisher and Dornbusch and McConnell and Brew and Philip Kotler and uh, David Acker and so on now we are having such kind of things but it, at the very beginning it was quite quite difficult by the way, I would, ask to, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what about my English? Do you understand me pretty well? Oh, yes. Yeah? No problem? Okay, good. And another question before I start serious issues. Um, do you have uh, some information about Russia? What do you know about Russia? What? What they taught us? Ah, but what they taught you? <laughs> well, a Russian history class right now. A Russian history <laughs> class right now. But okay, what is in the class? What what you learned from this class? Started at the period. Now we're up to Stalin. So. <laughs> uh huh. So. Well, at least you, <laughs> you you know something. Yes, but uh, do you know where Russia is? Oh, yeah. oh that's enough. You know. Okay, that's already good. 
so uh, then I think what is uh, also important to say that uh, St. Petersburg is situated just on the border with Finland, very close to Finland, two hours of drive uh, to um, uh, Finnish border, and then uh, it is situated on the Gulf of Finland, and it is uh, one of the biggest seaports of Russia. And starting from the very, very beginning, from the creation of St. Petersburg, because St. Petersburg was uh, founded by our Russian Tsar in 1703, that uh, is more than 300 years ago, uh, and uh, it was created really as a window to Europe because our famous Russian poet Alexander Pushkin said in one of his beautiful uh, poems that Peter the Great broken, uh, or broke the, the window to Europe by uh, building St. Petersburg. And a lot of wonderful architects from all over the world were uh, creating their masterpieces in St. Petersburg. For instance, Italians, Rossi, Trizini, uh, then uh, <clears throat> um, uh, also we have French architects as uh, um, Auguste Montferran, who created St. Isaac's Cathedral, and it is one of the third uh, of three uh, famous cathedrals, uh, St. Peter uh, in Rome, then St. Paul's in London, and St. Isaac's in St. Petersburg, one cupola cathedrals. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, uh, f building. And then uh, also we have some Germans uh, such as uh, Stackenschneider, for instance, he was also working in St. Petersburg. And we'll, uh, we have also uh, a lot of masterpieces uh, by Bartolomeo Rastrelli, that is also an uh, Italian one, that is wonderful Baroque style. So it's just fantastic place uh, to come and to visit. And St. Petersburg, it is a huge uh, city. It's 5 million population. And uh, Moscow is more than 10 million. Uh, and uh, I think St. Petersburg, it is uh, a large uh, educational, industrial, scientific, and cultural center of Russia. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were really living quite um, uh, 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 we, we passed really through uh, difficult uh, periods of our, our history development, uh, and I think our generation is really a unique one because we are, uh, were born in uh, the central planned economy period, and uh, we were already grown-ups, um, and we started you know, to, to teach at the university or at the period when there was still a central planned economy. And, uh, well, uh, we were partly in this period uh, of uh, the Cold War because uh, I think that um, um, it was uh, a period uh, of the development of our country when uh, the boundaries, uh, the boundaries were closed, and we were not having really great chance as professionals to communicate uh, with our uh, colleagues uh, abroad, and so we didn't have the chance to visit other countries, and uh, we didn't have the chance to compare uh, the uh, situation that we are having in our country and you are having here. And uh, at that time, we were really pretty, pretty sure that we were living in the best country of the world. And I think you were also pretty sure, or your parents at least were pretty sure, that you are living in the best country in the world, that the United States is just a great country and a lot of opportunities. But we were also pretty sure about USSR at that time, because we, we didn't have the possibility really to compare and, uh, well, um, I think uh, what is also quite important that uh, what I can uh, have as a memory is uh, from my early childhood that um, uh, now I this period is called the Cold War period, but uh, was it really the Cold War? 
as we are, as the normal citizens, feeling it. Well, we didn't um, have uh, at that time, I think, um, any special fear or any special, you know, or feeling of uh, um, an enemy towards the United States and to other Western countries. Uh, I think it's more the political games or these con con contradictions and other things, they were specially maybe created uh, in order to uh, to have some uh, more possibilities for uh, the big uh, companies that were producing weapons and so on, you know, to, to gain more profit and, and uh, so so on. But uh, as for the normal people, uh, I don't think that we really were that much involved uh, in uh, all this um, uh, uh, you know, enemy relations. No, not at all. Uh, but uh, what uh, I also remember pretty well, and it was absolutely true, uh, that foreigners were um, um, considered to be a special uh, people, and they were always in special hotels, uh, international hotels, and normal people were lo uh, not allowed to go in these hotels. Uh, and when I was a student, I uh, graduated during my evening hours uh, from the special uh, school of guides and interpreters in St. Petersburg. And I uh, was working with uh, the American groups and American individuals during my summer holidays. And um, at that time, uh, you know, I was observing this situation personally. Uh, how to enter the hotel, is it possible to communicate with foreigners for normal people or not? No, th we were not allowed as normal citizens. I was allowed because I, I had this special uh, certificate from uh, the schools, uh, from the School of Guide and Interpreters, and um, it was not a problem, but all the foreigners are saying that KGB, do you know what is KGB? Secret Service, yes. Uh, they were looking around and, you know, keeping the eye and controlling everybody. Well, I don't have such feeling. I didn't have such feeling. I was responsible for the group from morning till night. I was taking them from the hotel. I was going to the excursion, then for the lunch, then another um, uh, excursion, and that's it. And, uh, well, we didn't have some extra uh, bodyguards or something, nothing. Uh, but I was uh, responsible for the group, and I, I must be sure that everybody is uh, in the hotel or in the museum, so not to lose every, uh, somebody on, on the street and, and so on. So it was, uh, again, not that special as it was created as an image here or, or a certain myth that uh, everybody is checked, everybody is controlled, everybody is, uh, you know, after uh, under the special uh, covering and so on. But what was uh, really true that when we were looking on the television, uh, for instance, uh, uh, we saw a lot of uh, negative s sides of your economy. So they were showing inflation, they were showing unemployment, they were showing, you know, race segregation and uh, other problems. And uh, they were trying not to show a lot of positive things that you were having. And I think the same situation was uh, with your television. They were showing only, you know, quite, uh, quite uh, um, impressive from the negative point of view things about Russia and uh, about uh, other <laughs> socialist countries. So just really to create a certain, uh, you know, image or a certain atmosphere within the society. And uh, when for the first time I uh, went in 91 to Italy, to it was my first capitalist country that I visited, and when I returned back and I was speaking with my mother and I was explaining how interesting, uh, interesting it was and how people are living and so that the middle class is having, for instance, two cars within the family and they are living in the wonderful apartment and they are having that and that and so on and they are having children with a good education and no problem. 
And she said, no, but still they are having inflation and unemployment. And it was so difficult for me to convince her that, okay, maybe, yes, they are having this, but they are having a lot of very good things. And we don't have these things because we were standing in the line for many, many things just to buy. Because uh, according to the central planned economy, you know, uh, our plants were fulfilling the plans uh, for, produ uh, for production and then they were selling what was produced. And there were no foreign goods in our shops, just from time to time they were appearing, but then long, long, long queues were standing. And for instance, when uh, my first son was born, the eldest one, um, and it was in 1983, and uh, my uh, mother, she was standing in the long queue for six hours just to buy uh, the, the sport costume uh, for, for the baby. And when she came to the counter, it was uh, already no, the proper size, no proper size left. So, well, what to do? Either to go away, but she was standing six hours in a line just to buy it, and then of course, she she decided to buy something, at least something, and so she bought uh, three sizes ahead, and so this suit was laying uh, at home for three extra years when uh, my son was able really to put it on. But it was our life, you see, and it was really normal. And uh, when I was lecturing um, in um, other campuses of the Devonport University here uh, and also in uh, in Warren in Detroit uh, there was um, a possibility to tell how normal people were living at that time and uh, we were living uh, my family was living in a very very big commune flat we were 40 people in this flat 12 rooms and in each room there was a family, you see, and we were living in one room, my family was living in one room, and we had um, only one kitchen, one bathroom, and one toilet uh, for 40 people, and uh, I was living in this room with my grandmother, my father, and my mother until uh, I was 20. So uh, the first part of the room near the windows, it was almost mine because there was my uh, table for studies and, and uh, my, my bed. Then it was the, the part that my grandmother was mostly <laughs> occupying. And then uh, there were uh, the bookshelf and the wardrobe. And then uh, there was the part of the parents, you see. So in this way, we just, uh, you know, split it a little bit, the, the space. But again, it was normal for us. You see, everybody was living in, we didn't have the separate flats or separate apartments or separate houses. It was just normal conditions of living, and we were quite satisfied. And there was a question, were you happy? Of course we were happy, you see, because it was really normal. Everybody was living in the same conditions, and we were young, and we were enjoying life, and we were studying, and so no problem at all. And two uh, times a year we were going uh, to these beautiful demonstrations on the Palace Square in the center of St. Petersburg, uh, the demonstration devoted to the Great October Socialist Revolution in November and then the 1st of May, uh, that was the solidarity, international solidarity of the working people. But the, this idea came from, from Chicago, from <laughs> the demonstrations that you have here um, uh, many years ago. So. And we were pretty happy with all these uh, things. But I think um, uh, at uh, the, uh, the, the Cold War and this uh, you know, confrontation uh, finished uh, in uh, almost the middle uh, of 80s when Gorbachev came to power. And I think uh, you heard something about Mikhail Gorbachev, our president. Mm, and uh, I think he did really quite a good job for, for, for our country and also for the rest of the world because it's really 
you know, not possible to confront each other because not the nations are really confronting, but the, but, but the governments more or the politicians more. And people, what ordinary people would like to do, they really would like to, to, to live in peace, to educate their children, to grow up their children in, in the normal conditions and normal situations. And um, what he did, he opened really the world for Russia and Russia for the world. And that was uh, quite, quite a good thing for us. And starting from um, this period, we were able really to go abroad and uh, to to see other countries. And now Russians are the big, uh, the biggest travelers in the world also, because we are just really going there and there and there and would like to see more and to understand how other people are living. And uh, I think our students also are having wonderful opportunities now uh, for going and study abroad. And that is good, uh, I think, for their development and for their experience. And for Russian students, it's quite easy to do that because they are very good in languages. They are really excellent in foreign languages. And sometimes you are having, even as freshmen, as you are calling them here, uh, we are having uh, the students who are able you know, to speak fluently two languages. It could be English and German, or it could be English or Finnish, English and Spanish. English is the first, of course. It's always like that. Uh, but then, additionally, some uh, other language. And it's not a problem, really, to send them somewhere for, for studies and uh, uh, education. And uh, what is also very, very popular uh, among our students now, that is uh, the possibility to work and travel. And it's arranged especially by the <coughs> consulate of the United States in St. Petersburg. And, uh, a lot of our, our students are going during the summer vacation to uh, to uh, to United States. They are working somewhere, and then uh, for for the money that they are managed to earn, they are traveling all around uh, United States. So that's that's really good. <coughs> and uh, well, um, I think now um, people really understand when they got this opportunity and they got this possibility really to uh, to see uh, to visit other countries they now understand pretty well what is really good in russia and what is really bad in russia and what kind of changes we actually need to do in order to uh, to develop our country in uh, um, <coughs> in the proper way and uh, I think uh, that now people are really much more concerned about the um, Mm, their development issues because, uh, of course, we would like to develop uh, quicker and faster. But what we did uh, during the, uh, the last period, and we started the real changes in our economy, started in 1992. At first, Gorbachev opened the boundaries, yes. But the real changes, I mean the privatization and turn to the market economy, it started in 1992. In January, we started this mass privatization. And what we did during the first two years, we privatized uh, almost all our medium and small size enterprises. And it was very speedy process, just extremely speedy. If compare, for instance, Poland or Hungary, and they were more market oriented even before, they managed to privatize during the same period only 30% of their industry. But we managed to privatize almost all. So it was really very, very speedy. And sometimes it's happened uh, that uh, people were not really understanding exactly what is going on. Because uh, they were just told that we, we, need, we are going to this privatization and so on, and we need to do that. But uh, at the moment, uh, we are having more than 80% of our industry that is privatized. So we are functioning now on almost private, uh, privatized basis or private basis. And uh, we are having absolutely the same ownership structure as you are having. Now, it's very compatible because we are having still state-owned enterprises. We are having some still um, state-controlled enterprises. We are having joint stock companies. We are having partnerships. We are having individual enterprises. We are having uh, private farmers. 
and we are having 100% foreign capital enterprises, and we are having joint, uh, joint ventures, and we are having a lot of franchising systems uh, within Russia. So it's, uh, you know, very, very compatible. It's just absolutely the same as in normal uh, developed country. So, uh, and that is good. But um, on the other hand, you know, we started this uh, massive privatization in business, but what we need to do else? We need to create absolutely different environment as we had before. So uh, simultaneously, different uh, processes were going on in our economy. So this business development, then we need to uh, develop our legislation just at the same time, you see? And it was very difficult, in fact, at the very beginning, because for uh, it was not enough laws it was, uh, you know, very difficult to develop business, but they were trying to keep it the track, and it was simultaneously going on. So our first Duma, they adopted 780 laws in order to make it possible for business to develop, but it was not enough. So then the second one continued, and now the third one will continue. Uh, then uh, also what we had, um, uh, and we created at that time also the stock exchange. It was not existing. And then commercial banks, they, they were not existing. And then real estate market, it was not existing. And then insurance market, it was not existing. So all these, you know, institutions were developed uh, absolutely at the same time. And it was, you know, uh, on the one hand, it was difficult, but it was a good, uh, I think, period because they managed more or less to develop on the, all these institutions. And what, uh, what is very important, that institutional infrastructure for the development of business and uh, development uh, of the country. And, uh, well, they really succeed in doing this. Maybe not that perfect, but at least it's already a more or less, uh, more or less uh, civilized uh, way of uh, doing business and uh, economic development. And um, I think uh, uh, as a result, again, of all these uh, big, big changes, we have quite good uh, results in uh, the temples of growth of our GDP. So by this year, we will have 7.8% uh, uh, and it's much higher than here in the United States because as far as I, uh, I understood or while well, I am reading the newspapers here and also the looking on the television, well, it's not that very good now in the United States here and especially in the state Michigan. It's quite... Uh, uh, quite, quite, quite uh, a difficult time, and uh, even some of them, they are saying that United States are going to recession, and uh, also uh, the unemployment rate is quite high. But uh, we are developing quite fast now, but uh, it's normally like that in uh, developing countries, because uh, when uh, the economy is not that developed, of course, the, the, the country is able to demonstrate higher rate of, of growth than uh, the developed country. It's normal, I think. But uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we uh, manage uh, to decrease unemployment quite a lot. And uh, during the period, at the beginning of the transition, uh, what we had we had in uh, some parts of the country quite high rate of unemployment something about 14 and 15 percent but uh, for instance now in st petersburg we are having 0.3 percent so it's absolutely nothing you see and uh well um, a lot uh, of american companies now are coming to st petersburg so, uh, and they are really facing the problem of uh, finding uh, enough uh, qualified personnel for their stuff because um, there are so many of them. For instance, Coca-Cola is there as for production. Coca-Cola is there. Pepsi-Cola is there. Ford Motor Company is in St. Petersburg uh, starting from the year 2002. We are having the production plant of Ford. Then uh, GM 
is starting the production just now. Then our, we are having Procter & Gamble. They are making the uh, packaging and bottling uh, of their products in St. Petersburg. Then we are having Johnson & Johnson. Then we are having uh, big consultant companies such as PricewaterhouseCoopers, then Ernst & Young, then Deloitte, then McKinsey. So all these companies are present there. Then in the banking uh, sector, we are having City Group. Then we are having all your franchising uh, fast food uh, chains. We are having McDonald's, we are having Pizza Hut, we are having Burger King, then we are having uh, Subway, uh, then uh, Starbucks is coming to Russia and they opened already the first uh, coffee shop in Moscow and then afterwards they will have this expansion to other places. Then uh, Walmart is coming also to Russia. But we are having also a lot of uh, international other chains because Germans were really the first just to open, for instance, Metro. There is a chain, uh, uh, a big chain in St. Petersburg and in other cities. Then IKEA, the Swedish one, is present there. Then uh, Ashan, that is French one, it is also present already. So maybe Walmart is a little bit late. But they are coming, <laughs> well, and if they will develop the strategy as the big uh, discounter, then they could be successful. Well, we'll see. Uh, but uh, definitely they will find quite, quite a serious competition on the market, that's for sure. And, uh, well, uh, as we were having this big experience in communicating with the international companies, uh, you know, are uh, a lot of uh, um, foreign specialists are working within the companies as uh, managers, as uh, the uh, CEOs. And for instance, at Ford Motor, the general director is Theo Streit. He is German by nationality, but uh, he was working here in headquarters uh, of Ford Motor in Detroit, and now he is in Russia. Then, uh, for instance, the human resource uh, manager, Adrian Stead. He is from Great Britain originally, and he was working also in Germany, and now he is in Russia. And also uh, other CEOs uh, from Ford, they are um, uh, Dutch people and Belgian people and some Americans. So who knows, maybe you in several years you will also come <laughs> to Russia and, and uh, will have this possibility to work there. And uh, a lot of people are um, in Deloitte, for instance, there are a lot of them from, uh, from um, other countries and uh, in Coopers and, and so on. So we have really a lot of foreigners who are working and living in Russia and they are enjoying uh, the situation because they said Russia is now just the proper place, you know, just to make business and to make success and to make great career development because uh, the country is really developing very, very fast. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, from all these changes we got quite a lot of social problems because in former years people were really uh, feeling themselves very, very secure and, uh, well, um, they were uh, receiving, uh, especially those who were getting the fixed uh, uh, fixed financial support from the government. I, I mean the old people, for instance, they were receiving quite good pensions. But now uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite difficult, especially for the old people, because they uh, don't have the possibility or some of them don't have the strength to work extra. Um, after pension, and so that's why they are limited, very limited, only with this amount of, of pension, and so that's why for them it's really very, very hard to live. But on the other hand, uh, we are having uh, uh, now, <laughs> we are having millionaires, and we are having multimillionaires, and we are having even billionaires, and uh, there are uh, according to statistical data, there are something uh, like 53 uh, billionaires within Russia. Well, and 
it's quite uh, quite a number, I think. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it is possible to say that there is a very, very big gap between the rich people and the poor people. And uh, not, uh, not that uh, much of the middle class. And you know that middle class is really providing the stability for, for the country. Uh, and that is still our big, big problem uh, to create more middle class uh, people, not this, you know, just contrast, big, big contrast between uh, the rich people and uh, the poor people. And uh, by the year uh, 2020, according to the plan of our uh, president, Putin, uh, we will have 50, uh, 55 percent of the middle class. Well, that sounds good, but uh, normally the country need to have uh, more than 60 percent of the middle class to make it more more stable uh, for the development. But um, 13 years still are left for achieving uh, such kind of results. But I think now we are having something about 20% uh, of the middle class, not more. And it's not really the middle class because, uh, well, middle class uh, is really something stable. But in our situation, it could be, you know, one day quite stable and the other day it could be a problem because uh, either uh, stronger competitors are coming uh, to the market or uh, some problems within uh, the purchasing power of the population and so on. So that's why uh, uh, if uh, we will track the tendency of the development of um, medium and small size companies, uh, it's not possible to say that there is uh, uh, a very, very uh, um, very persistent growth no, it's more or less fixed as it was, uh, for instance, six years ago, and it, it may be uh, a little bit more now. It is something about uh, one uh, thousand uh, um, enterprises, but that's not really very, very big for um, 100,000 enterprises, not that very big for, for, for the whole country. And uh, so, uh, well, Mm, I think uh, this uh, social uh, problem, I, I think now the government is uh, trying to change uh, a lot of uh, things within our development and they turn more to the problems uh, of the normal people and uh, uh, now what we are having, we have uh, several national projects they are called. And there are five of them in education, then in medical sphere, then in agriculture, then in uh, housing, and also in uh, innovations. That uh, government is really investing quite a lot in, in these uh, things because we are earning quite a lot of money from our oil export. And uh, uh, they put some money for the development of the high schools. They put some money for the development of the universities. Uh, they, uh, they put some uh, money for the possibility of uh, our uh, teachers also to be trained abroad and to travel uh, to other countries and to see what kind of experience we are, um, we are lacking. And uh, I think in 2005, we are signed the Bologna Declaration. And due to this Bologna Declaration, we are changing our system of education uh, from the five-year education uh, to the two-level system, as you are having here. So bachelor degree and master degree. And why we are doing it, um, that is because uh, I think we would like to be really more international in uh, our educational process and uh, our students could have um, uh, more possibilities uh, to go abroad and to bring these credit points that could be, you know, just um, put in their curriculum because before that uh, they were going abroad for education but they need to continue and pass the same exams, sometimes even the same exams, but in Russia. And these credit points for, uh, that uh, they were bringing from abroad, they doesn't matter. 
So they just need to uh, to uh, go through uh, this uh, system and training again. So uh, it was quite quite tough, I think, for uh, for our students and. Um, um, but we need to work very seriously on this issue in order to make it possible to compare these uh, these programs that you are having and we are having, uh, in order to to provide the the same weight for such uh, kind of uh, programs and uh, exchanges, and um, mm, I think that um, <coughs> our students. Uh, differs from you uh, uh, in another way also uh, not only um, not only uh, from from this point of view but uh, also um, they are much younger um, so they are graduating from the uh, secondary of high school at the age of 17 and then afterwards they are um, they can uh, enter the university, but uh, they need to pass the uh, very strict entering exams. And uh, that, that is very, very serious uh, selection. And 75% uh, of our students, they're not paying for their education still. Uh, so for these uh, free places at the university, uh, the the competition is very, very high. Sometimes it could be seven people per one place or ten people per one place or even 20 uh, per one place. It, it depends on the educational um, uh, field where, where you are going to specialize. And so that's why... Um, they are really uh, trying very hard, and they are uh, very, very motivating, uh, motivated at the very beginning, and they know exactly where they would like to go and what uh, kind of education they would like to have at the age of 17. Sometimes there are cases when our parents are advising to our uh, students, you know, you need to go to this uh, school or that school, and it's demanded by our, by the um, economy. But uh, I think uh, as uh, our children are mm, growing in this transition now, they uh, already feel and uh, they understand how important the education is, and how important is really to get uh, the good marks and good education. And so really they are, during these last years of their studying in high schools, they really already know what they would like to be. And uh, when they are successful in uh, passing of these entering exams, we are having really excellent students, most of them, are just from the very beginning, you know, they are having uh, good abilities to study. They are uh, good in languages. They are mm, having uh, good, uh, you know, computer skills and uh, analytic skills. And what surprised me also here that you have uh, the classes within uh, the. Uh, for instance, a community college or even the university, you are having the classes of English language. You see? How to write, how to read, how to compose. Wow! For me, you know, it was an opening, real, a real opening, because we are not teaching such kind of disciplines for our students at the very beginning. No, they're supposed to know all these things from the high schools. And when they pass these serious exams, you know, the basis is already there. So we are not really teaching these things at the university. Uh, during the first years, we are teaching the uh, economics. Already starting from scratch, we are t teaching economics, we are teaching uh, history, we are teaching world history, we are teaching philosophy, we are... Uh, teaching uh, mathematics, a lot of mathematics during the first year of studies, our first years of studies, and uh, uh, mathematics sometimes is difficult for for the students, but they are 
trying very hard and they are quite successful and normally our students are studying within five years. It's very uh, rare that we find the students who are studying seven years or eight years or nine years. No. Five years, so they're graduating at the uh, age of 22 and especially at the very, very beginning of all these changes, you know, such specialists with market-oriented thought or, or uh, way of thinking and uh, special preparation and education, they were very, very demanded by our enterprises. And some of our graduates, for instance, they managed to have just excellent uh, mm, uh, jobs. And at the age of 24, for instance, they could become the presidents of the bank or the CEO of the big company or the regional manager for, for some company, for some international company, and so on. And uh, I think uh, here it's quite a difficult, you know, to, to, to find such kind of, of example of a very, very successful um, even start, you see. And, uh, well, I can give you the example of my son. He graduated also from our, our school, and I was uh, the teacher of him in, in one of the classes, and it was quite a difficult job for me because I was really trying to do my best, you know, because uh, all the students can say, oh, your mommy was so lousy or so such and such. So I was really trying, you know, very, very hard to, to improve his image and my image as well, <laughs> you see. And it was, uh, and then I was asking him how it was. And he said, well, it was okay. And he said, yes, really? Yes, I am proud of you. Okay, thank you so much <laughs> for, for that. And now, you see, he graduated at the uh, age of 22 from the university, and uh, he started to work in uh, Coca-Cola first, and then uh, another big international company um, in soft drinks uh, invited him to be a general manager uh, or a regional, a regional manager uh, of St. Petersburg and northwest of Russia. Well, it's quite something. And I asked him, would you like to be an academic? He said, no, 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 no. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not for me. I would like to be the business person. And he is very good in that because he is uh, possessing good skills in organization, communication, and, uh, uh, well, uh, negotiation and, and so on. So he is very satisfied with his job. But why it is possible? Because there is a lack of such trained, well-trained people, you see, now. And um, for instance, our graduates from our faculty, they are working. The Minister of Finance of Russia, Alexei Kudrin, he is our graduate. And he is on this position already for many years. Then the economic advisor of our President Putin for seven years was my former student, Andrei Larionov. Well, then the minister of the uh, anti-monopoly regulation, Ilya Yuzhanov, he is also my former student. And we have so many, and President Putin, he is the graduate of the law school of our university. And in Moscow, we are having now a lot of representatives of, of St. Petersburg State University. And also within St. Petersburg, we are having uh, I think in almost every sphere, sphere, we are having our alumni everywhere, in banking, in production sphere, in, in the real estate companies, in insurance companies, just everywhere. And that is good because uh, St. Petersburg State University is a real brand and uh, for our graduates it's very easy uh, to, to find uh, a good job uh, if you are really good, of course. And what is also interesting, that um, Russia in Soviet period, uh, Russia was producing a lot of engineers, a lot of technical people. And uh, maybe you even know that uh, 
uh, it was again the period of the Cold War when uh, Russia started to put Sputnik first and then Yuri Gagarin went first to space and then America was very frightened with these achievements and they said oh, Russians now will, uh, will look from the top and, and be the spies and so on and so forth and we need to, to follow Russia in this technical track and tactical uh, development but what happened afterwards <laughs> you see uh, we, the, we switched to this market economy and then we start to produce a lot of economists we start to produce a lot of accountants we start to produce a lot of lawyers we start to produce a lot of managers but not that many technical people and now we have a problem with technical specialists you see and now we are turning again <laughs> back to uh, because there is a great demand uh, from a lot of companies within St. Petersburg uh, with a really good uh, good technical education. Now technical education is becoming very 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 uh, competitive uh, as well. So <clears throat> and. Um, uh, what uh, also uh, I think important uh, to continue in order to make the, the full picture for you about uh, our education that 75% are not paying and they also can receive some stipendiums some social assistance from th from the government if they are studying good and excellent or excellent and good but these stipendiums are very very small that is something about 30 percent uh, 30 dollars per month that's just for public transportation and we have very very good system of public transportation not as here you have the all of you are having cars uh, our students now also are some of them are having cars but mostly all of the students are using the public transportation that's the metro system or underground and buses trolley buses uh, trams and so on it's functioning all over the city and it's it's really good and uh, so this uh, 30 uh, 30 dollars that they are receiving as stipendiums is quite okay only for for public transportation not for living not for for support and so that's why uh, we are having mostly now we are having our uh, students from St. Petersburg or St. Petersburg region uh, because it's quite uh, expensive to travel and uh, to come for education to St. Petersburg because it's high living costs there and uh, also um, uh, the ticket for the railroad for instance or the plane is also very expensive uh, when I was a student we had students from all over the country and it was good and they were living in the students hostels and it was okay it was affordable at that time but now uh, not very many students are coming for studies to St. Petersburg or Moscow because it's very expensive only when they are having wealthy parents and parents are able to support them and to pay for their education and uh, most uh, of, uh, of uh, the um, uh, parents from uh, other parts of the countries they are not able to do that so that's why either you are staying and having the education in your own city in other part of the country or well you, you are maybe even coming to, to St. Petersburg but only for um, education by correspondence such cases are also existing uh, when uh, you need to travel only two times to, to St. Petersburg but then 25% uh, are paying for the education and what is the difference of free education and commercial education or um, education on the payment basis uh, those uh, students who are paying for the education they don't need to pass these entering exams they are only writing uh, writing the test uh, and the test is in Russian uh, language then also mathematics history and social sciences it's complicated test but it's just checking your abilities to study and your knowledge basic knowledge and then you are having the conversation with the special commission and then if you pass then you can enter so it's a certain guarantee you see for the parents 
to avoid this very severe competition and maybe um, to keep some health for, for their children because uh, it's always very, very nervous procedure, you know, just to, to pass these exams. And so these par uh, those parents who are able to pay for the education, they just choose this way. And then they are paying for the education during the, the, the whole way of education. So if you choose to pay, then uh, you are not able to, to switch from payment to not payment. Then you are paying all the time. And the uh, rate of payment uh, is, uh, uh, for our, uh, for instance, school is not the highest in the city because the law school is charging more than the philological school is charging more than the Institute of uh, Economics and Finance is charging more. And our, uh, within our faculty, it also depends, but uh, we are charging from 200 uh, uh, to uh, two thousand five hundred dollars uh, till uh, three hundred five uh, three thousand five hundred dollars uh, for different majors. You see, a year, and then five years of studies, and then you can cal calculate. But that is only for education, not for living, not for other things. That is only for education. And um, also, uh, these uh, students who are paying for the education, they are having the uh, other extra benefits. Uh, for instance, uh, during the session, um, when you are passing the exams, uh, our normal students, they have the right to pass the exam only twice. If you uh, failed one once, then you can try another time. And if you failed again, then it is a special commission and you are trying the third time, and then you are out. But for these students who are paying for the education, they can try two extra times more, you see? And then it's a certain, again, a benefit for, for the students. Uh, I can't say that uh, the students who are paying for the education, they are um, lower in their abilities. No, not always. Sometimes, yes. But sometimes they are just excellent. But that is because they really would like to be the students and not to pass through this uh, serious uh, procedure of selection. That is uh, because of that. And due to this money that uh, the university is receiving now for this uh, payment education, uh, we are able also to um, put um, uh, a lot of uh, reconstruction within our um, buildings and also to provide some more computer uh, computer possibilities but frankly speaking our computer system uh, is uh, maybe not that sufficient as yours you have much more computers that is one thing and another thing is that your computers are more speedy in comparison with ours so for instance if uh, we would like to introduce this um, online online education I'm not sure that it will work pretty well. And also, for, uh, for instance, uh, simulation games and uh, what uh, other possibilities are. I, I learned here in, in Devonport University quite a lot of things. But uh, well, um, uh, I, I don't think that we are real, uh, really able to introduce uh, such things uh, at the moment. But maybe in a few years, we, we can do that uh, also. and. Um, Mm, uh, then what we are doing, uh, we received the third building for the university facilities and we are reconstructing this building also by ourselves now. And uh, I think we'll have more, uh, more uh, nicer facilities for, for the students as well, more space, so to speak. Uh, because you have a lot of different, you know, uh, things that you can just uh, go in, sit, to discuss in small groups and so on. We don't have such possibilities, unfortunately. That That is our big minus, I, I think. And uh, that's kind of things also pressing me. I think you are quite lucky being here with your facilities and your 
educational possibilities and also for instance within the library you are having uh, wonderful access to the databases and to uh, e-books and so on uh, unfortunately we don't have such kind of things uh, so it's 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 developing but it's it's quite difficult for instance lexus nexus da database it's it's uh, well very very expensive for us and uh, we we had this possibility to try it but not for for a, a long period of time so then it is it's really different but uh, i think it's um, also, as a conclusion of this, I think our education is really uh, quite uh, good and quite competitive because when we were se sending our students abroad, they were very, very, uh, you know, uh, comfortable in other countries and other environments because now they are learning absolutely the same stuff that you are learning. So they are very good in, you know, in adaptation to, to the situation and that that's good. That, that's really good. Uh, I think result of uh, our efforts uh, in the educational process. Well, I think now our time <laughs> is more or less out. What kind of questions do you have for me? <clears throat> okay. You said uh, transition to privatization was really, really speedy. Yes. Why? Was it a matter of national pride? You wanted to show what you could do it, or was it a, you didn't want anyone kind of... It was just a policy. I think it was just a policy that it was introduced uh, by by the government, and uh, well, um, I think they need really to to make big changes, just uh, as as uh, um, as uh, quick as possible, uh, because uh, for instance, when Gorbachev started all these changes, you know, it was good for opening, for understanding, and all these things, but basic things were actually not changing. And then we were, uh, five years we were just discussing, just discussing and discussing and you know. But then they said, okay, stop discussion, let's do. And so they started in 1992 and they did it quite quickly. Yeah. Yes, just <laughs> be in the water and then you start <laughs> to swim. <laughs> Yes, that was the uh, the main idea. I think it was like that. But as a result, I think we we had quite a lot of problems because uh, on the one hand it was good, but on the other hand, you know, a lot of uh, problematic issues uh, appeared. For instance, I, I told you that people were not really realizing what is going on, and sometimes now they are. Some of them are very rich. Those who were that smart at that time, so they got it. Already they are. And then, now they are very rich. But the rest are so much. So yeah, it's just very, very good introduction. Yeah, some other questions? Okay. You said, you mentioned how in the United States we would see all the bad things that happen in the communist countries and vice versa. Yeah. Now that it's over, we still hear a lot about like KGB assassinations and things like that. And we still hear people like Gary Kasparov speak out against Putin. And I'm wondering, how much of a fair perception do you think we really have of your government? How, like, what what is the state of affairs there politically? Because I'm curious uh, if perhaps maybe our media is still just uh, playing off of maybe residual fears of the Soviet era in the Cold War, uh, or maybe you know, our perception. Yes, I'm I'm reading quite a lot of newspapers here in order really to understand if it's uh, very objective or subjective uh, in order to to get this uh, information and. Um, well, our, uh, you know, our, they are depicting, uh, so to speak, quite objectively now. But on the other hand, what is possible to feel that they are choosing uh, sometimes uh, only, again, only very impressive for the public things, you see? Uh, of course, uh, Gary Kasparov was um, uh, even put in prison for five days because he was leading this uh, walk of, uh, you know, opponents to, to, to the uh, legal system, yes. But uh, they were not, for instance, uh, putting, that, uh, putting that much attention to uh, other things. So th that is really sound. You, yes? 
and then they are writing a lot about it but uh, they are um, and it's true I, I, I don't have anything against it it's, it's true it was uh, like this yes but are the they are not showing uh, other things that, for instance, uh, a lot of uh, people are really uh, eager to have, for instance, uh, Putin for, for the rest of uh, um, for the rest of the year, uh, not the terms, but for the third term, they would like to have Putin as the president of the country because now they believe him, and now th there is really a certain stability because if we will compare this year with the year 2000 or 99 it's a big big difference and now people are more convinced and more and more uh, so to speak safe yes and then also for instance with this uh, KGB uh, play I think it's um, well we are not feeling like that you see it's not that much control no and so from this point of view it's a little bit uh, of course it's present somewhere Yes, but they are focusing more on it, and they are stressing more on it, so that to make you feel again that something is going uh, like that, but it's not, you see? So from the one hand, it's really objective, but from the other hand, they are again focusing on some negative things only. They are not focusing that much on the positive things. And it was not only here, for instance, I was uh, one month, uh, in Norway, we were elaborating the master programs there uh, with our colleagues in June, it was. And then on the television, Russia was quite often, almost every day. And then they were again showing only, you know, very, uh, very bad things, you see. And they were not showing good things. Said, I'm so disappointed. Why it is like this? Why your newsmakers are doing this focus only. They must focus on everything. But they are not interested in showing good things. They are interested in showing bad things. So, Nick, you seem really very positive about the economic situation. It's we are, yes. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, maybe if you, you track uh, your uh, newspapers uh, it, in Financial Times, I think uh, the previous week there was an article about the normal family in Moscow, and uh, the family name is uh, Starodubov, and they are where, are, and the article was, the whole page was devoted to, to this family, and then are, they were asking a lot of questions, and they were just explaining how they went through, through this transition. It was difficult, they lost the jobs, and then, <coughs> You know, uh, what happened, it was a difficult time, the, the refrigerator was empty, and um, it was not that easy, but now they showed also the refrigerator, and the refrigerator is full of, you know, food stuff, and they managed to buy for uh, their daughter the computer, and she is uh, studying, and they are... Um, they managed to buy the new furniture and other things and they asked them would you like to turn back and they said no we don't want because now we are really pretty sure about uh, our possibilities we know how to adopt this situation and it was difficult through this period but they don't want to turn back that was the conclusion uh, from this article, and uh, well, I think as as much as such kind of uh, examples, for, for instance, you will you will have in your press, more objective, uh, then you will understand uh, better the, the situation within all our changes. It it was de uh, definitely difficult, definitely difficult, and I had the. Uh, the uh, question um, in uh, in uh, Dearborn campus, uh, and uh, the question was, how uh, what is the percentage of the people who would like to return back? And you see, we are still have the Communist Party, and the Communist Party is really supported mainly by the old people because they are suffering mostly from all these things. 
and uh, if you will see the results, the official results of our elections, uh, the party of Putin is having more than 60%, but the uh, Communist Party is having uh, something about 12%. It's, it's also quite, quite, you know, and then there is the Liberal Democratic Party, and then uh, that is 10 point something. And you see, the second one is Communist Party. Yes, but why it is this? Because all the old people are supporting the communists. You see, they were pretty good at that time. They were really secure, but they lost all their savings. They lost all their money during this transition period, and now they are really the the um, part of the population that is really suffering, really suffering. So that's why I was speaking about um, the, these social um, problems uh, within Russia and I think our government needs to pay more attention to social issues now because it's not possible, you know, just to make in one minute just to, from a uh, communist system to, to the market economy system without thinking about the population. Now, you see, it was, uh, on the one hand it was this jump into the water, but on the other hand, it was very painful for, for a lot of people. So that's why they need to, to make some, some kind of adaptation and some kind of uh, changes in their points. Yeah. Is your guys' media still state-run there, or is that privatized? It depends. We are having uh, some state-run, but uh, a lot of them are private. A lot of them are private. So we are now having a lot of different opinions and also on the television we are having different channels. We have two state-owned and then the rest are either regional or they are private. So there are different points. We, we can switch from one to another and compare how, how they are depicting the news. I'm sorry that there was the... the okay. It's often I've said that in China they decided to make the transition economically first, mm -hmm. to go from the central command system to a more diverse uh, free enterprise in part system. And then they will get um, political reform in installments later on. Mm -hmm. And it was oftentimes said that what Gorbachev tried to do was to first do the politics and hope that eventually the economy would come along and it got out of control. Inflation, as you said, just destroyed the old people who could live on $30 a month. Now you can't live on $30 a day in some cases, you know. So would you say that there was some validity to uh, that? Uh, I think so. Uh, the thing is that we are trying to copy a lot from Japan, uh, from, from China as well, because we are looking all the time and try to compare. And at the very beginning of uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, uh, we had uh, also some advisors from Argentina, you see, and they were advising how to switch and so on. And then our, uh, we are having a very, very good relations with China and our scientists, they uh, wrote uh, the book and uh, even from our chair, uh, we have the book that is published in Russia and in China, the comparative analysis of the reforms in China and in Russia. And uh, you know, China was demonstrating uh, the highest rate of growth. 17%, 18%, 20% per year, it, it's uh, really impressive in, in comparison with uh, Russia and what kind of uh, um, achievements uh, China is having. Uh, well, but still, I think it's possible to say that uh, China is also having some parts of the country well developed, very wealthy, and a lot of the country very poor. Right. So from this point of view, I think it's, um, well, uh, they were speaking about that it was better just to start as China did, but, uh, well, we started as we started. Of course, it was, I think, a certain mistake just to start it from the top. That, 
that, that, that is, uh, I think, and uh, well, but uh, actually what Gorbachev did, he really did uh, this big opening for the world, and that was important. That was just really the, the, uh, the stop of the Cold War, in fact, that he did. Th that is very important, I think. Okay. Is the Russian media as biased as the American media? You picked up that our media is so negative. Is the Russian media that way? Also negative. Yes, uh, I think now it is, uh, well, not towards America, but in general, uh, uh, you know, in former years, our media was trying to make us happy. So there were only positive news everywhere, on the television, in, in the newspapers, everywhere, only positive media and positive news. And of course, people were much happier. But now, when they are <laughs> well, when you are opening the newspapers and you read, this one was in the car accident, and this one was in bankruptcy, and this one was there. It's not towards America, but just our general news. And well, you are <laughs> you are becoming so depressed after all this <laughs> news. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it is the, um, the nature of all media. They want to have this hot, hot news, hot dogs, you know, just to impress. But sometimes it's, it's so depressive. And, uh, well, of course, I would like to have so, such kind of information, but not that much. But now it's, it's switched to, to a lot of such kind of things. Yeah. Environment. Yes. 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 Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. It's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, well, uh, with all these uh, changes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to, to, to speak here. <clears throat> well. Um, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, with all these changes, now we are really more international. So we need to accept a lot of environmental uh, issues as well. And we are, um, what we did, we established and adopted through the State Duma the special environmental law, which is quite strict. And we try to follow it. And uh, specialists are, when they are analyzing this law, they are saying that it is very progressive. So it was done um, <clears throat> while using all the positive examples from Western countries, because we were creating this law for the first time in our life. It was not existing. We just did it. So we learned about all the positive examples all around the world, and we, we created this law. But uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of our technologies, they were quite old, even in, our, <coughs> in the aircraft. So uh, maybe you know that uh, some of the uh, um, European airports, they were not allowing uh, the Russian, uh, some of Russian uh, aircrafts to land because of this environmental problem. So uh, now they are trying to modernize uh, all uh, the things, and uh, they are not allowing the old uh, aircrafts to go uh, there. That is one thing. And also for car industry, it is very important also. Uh, uh, we got a lot of second-hand cars from Poland, from Germany. Uh, they were exported to Russia, and a lot of our Russian people were buying because they were quite cheap in comparison with the new ones, but they can able, you know, just uh, uh, to, to work uh, because the roads in Europe are much better than in Russia, so you can have, for instance, eight years old car and it will be okay for the Russian roads, no problem. <laughs> and uh, then uh, this environmental issue again appeared, so uh, now it's not allowed to have uh, the car um, that is um, imported from uh, Germany, for instance, uh, older than 10 years. No, it's strictly, uh, strictly regulated. So uh, now they are trying uh, to follow uh, these environmental issues also, and uh, within the companies, within big companies also. And I was, uh, during the first week of staying here, I had the possibility to speak with the um, CEO of environmental policy and safety of uh, general 
uh, motors uh, who are coming to Russia and they will start the production and she said that we are trying to implement uh, the environment pol uh, environmental policy in Russia and we will be very strict in, in that uh, within uh, our plant so now all the international companies they are pretty pretty good in in, in keeping this environmental issue yeah okay yes <coughs> With Belarus, uh, well, <coughs> it's uh, it's a special kind of relations. <laughs> well, uh, the thing is that uh, you know uh, we uh, when um, USSR split it and uh, we received a lot of uh, independent states. Yes, former republics of the USSR they became the independent states, and uh, well, um, it was. Uh, the decision of the governments, the decision maybe even of the people, are, but it's as it is. And uh, but Belarus, uh, I think um, we were very close together because you know we are Slavic nations, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. We are just very very close together, and so uh, we were supporting. Um, uh, Belarus a lot and uh, well we were having a lot of our plants for instance they were uh, having a lot of uh, suppliers from Belarus and uh, they would like to keep these relations uh, because when uh, the borders appeared then what to do either to uh, find the new suppliers or to to pay the custom taxes or what to do or to introduce the production within their own plants. So that's why there was the idea of uh, uh, still uh, having this very, very close relations, Russia and Belarus, as a special connection in between two countries. And as, uh, as a result of it, uh, Belarus was uh, receiving the oil on a special price and receiving the gas on a special price, not the market price, but special price, that that was just because of the special kind of relations. But then there was a period of uh, uh, contradiction again, and uh, so some things uh, Belarus would like to accept, some things not. Then they were uh, were speaking about the uh, united uh, state, Belarus and Russia. Then there will be some one president and it's not was well accepted uh, by by president lukashenko for instance because of course he would not like to to lose his position so there must be two presidents <laughs> so it's not that easy no it's special kind of relations but still there are uh, i think in comparison with uh, other um, former uh, republics of uh, ussr it's a special kind of relations between Russia and, and Belarus. Well, okay. What kind of? Yes. So uh, I can uh, I can translate uh, the question. Uh, the question was about the uh, really the contradictions, national kind of, of contradictions uh, between uh, the Russian people and the rest, because uh, we are having uh, now really different um, nationalities of course, not now but we were always having and uh, to a certain extent uh, russian spirit or proud or that you are russian that it's really very very uh, serious well it's uh, i think uh, such kind of problem is uh, existing 
That's true. Uh, and uh, why it is existing? Because uh, um, when uh, all these republics uh, split it to uh, the different states and, um, for instance, uh, uh, in Baltic states, uh, they were um, trying to um, uh, to abolish the education in Russian language in schools, and they were trying to um, uh, fire uh, Russian people from the administrative bodies and so on. You see, and uh, also, for instance, in Kazakhstan, it also happened like that, and in many other republics, it was not only Russian spirit that was going up, but it was national spirit that was going up all around the big USSR, the former USSR. So every uh, every nation was struggling for, you know, be more important than the others, and it happened in many places. I think that was uh, uh, really, uh, you know, essential. It was uh, it was uh, expected uh, like that. It was possible to expect like that because, uh, well. Mm, I think it was uh, very important for people from different nations just uh, to to be confident within their own nations and to keep the language and so on. It's understandable. But on the other hand, uh, you know, Russia was always helping to all other republics a lot. And then uh, Russians were also thinking about uh, uh, themselves why we are now the second nation because, for instance, in Kazakhstan, now there are still 60% of Russians living, and they are fired. 40%. Hmm? 40%. 40%. Okay. Let's make it 40%. Yes, 40%. And then they are out of all these legislative bodies. And we were preparing, uh, within the university, for instance, we were preparing a lot of uh, specialists from the, uh, for higher institutions, for universities in Kazakhstan. And we are having many friends there. And for us, it's, it's difficult also to understand why it is like that. And also what happened, now we are having a lot of illegal workforce towards Moscow and St. Petersburg from other republics, from Moldova, from Belarus, from Ukraine, from Kazakhstan, from Turkmenistan, from uh, Azerbaijan, from uh, Georgia, from, uh, from all former republics. We are having a lot, uh, not only legal, but legal force. And they are working, in, especially in big cities, and then they are sending the money to their own families that are there. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are really contradictions between the nations. We didn't have, for instance, in St. Petersburg that many uh, people from uh, f f former republics as we are having now. They are working on the construction uh, uh, fields. They are working in... Uh, are in some very, very primitive, uh, you know, kind of, of, of jobs. And, of course, they are not that wealthy. Of course, they are quite poor, because they are sending a lot of money outside Russia. And then, they could su such kind of problems appeared, as skinhead, for instance, as you, as you said. It's, uh, th there were several cases, but... Uh, the, the police is checking all these things quite quite seriously, and there were some several court procedures when uh, there was the family of, uh, I think it was uh, Turkmenian uh, family that the girl was uh, was killed, yes, in, in St. Petersburg, and also there were some cases in Moscow and in some other big cities. Well, it's violence, of course it is. It is. It's not normal. But, uh, well, that was just the reaction, uh, maybe. Uh, it's, it's not because that really the, uh, we are Russians and we are, you know, no, not because of that, but because of, of the difficulties that are coming in the, in the economy. No. Thank you very much for your question. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I never really thought 
thought about what Russia's immigration would be like. Yes, we were not thinking about that uh, because at that time, you know, and you can prove that we were considered to be really equal and we were friends and there were, for instance, within one family there, were, uh, there was the Russian uh, husband and uh, maybe the uh, Kazakh uh, wife or you see, it was a mixture of all the nationalities and uh, there were no conflicts at all, but now there are. Well, what was the reason for that? I think it's again started from, from the political issue and now it's going down to economic things because, you know, people are coming for any money in Russia. They don't have the jobs in uh, their own states. That's a problem. That's really a problem. And um, it's quite, yeah. You were talking about uh, Russia's national pride and I can't kind of the way it's taught, the way I perceive it is here, that it was like when the Cold War came to an end that the United States said, you know, we've won, or, you know, like there was an actual war going on. How was it uh, taken in Russia, like, I guess, how did the people perceive that? I mean, obviously, it wasn't like everybody was dejected, like, you, your system had, had failed, you know, it's just, how, how was the people's... It was, it was very difficult for the people, but, you know, it went uh, on, uh, I should say, quite successfully without any blood. You see this transition, because it's amazing how it happened, because they started from this uh, central plant economy, absolutely different system, and different psychology, and different understanding of all the things, and then we switched to this, very serious uh, environment now and market environment and ve very competitive environment and very risky environment and that uh, not maybe that um, safe environment for, for the people but no blood, you see, no real struggle. It was quite smooth and that's amazing, you see, because uh, well, almost everywhere, you know, there are a lot of uh, struggle, a lot of battles, a lot of uh, other things. But uh, it it went it it went very difficult, very painful for the population, especially for certain parts of the population. But it was quite good, you see. And uh, well, the the results of these uh, elections, I think now, uh, I think it's really possible to see that a lot of people are supporting. Uh, the uh, the course of uh, our existing president and because they just believe in it well i, I and i we were pretty uh, i think we were pretty happy with uh, the end of the cold war that's for sure because uh, you know russians were never uh, initiating the uh, the uh, the war actions, it was, I think, a big mistake in uh, Afghanistan when uh, they entered uh, to Afghanistan, but we, we never started first. Napoleon was the first to come to Russia, and then we were defending our country. Then the First World War, then the Second World War, when Hitler, uh, Hitler came, and we again were defending our country, and we lost so many... Uh, so many uh, people there, and uh, we we uh, we had so many uh, cities destroyed, and we really had great great losses uh, uh, during the Second World War. And according to some statistics, uh, that is about 29 million that we lost. According to other statistics, it's 40 million that we lost in our population. You see, only in population, and not only the military people, but civil population. And a lot of people died from starvation, for instance, in St. Petersburg. And my mother was uh, during the, the blockade or the siege in St. Petersburg, and uh, my grandmother was there, and I heard a lot of stories of them, how, how it was terrible and how it was difficult. Because uh, the city, the, the whole city was blocked for 900 days without any food. And uh, the, the citizens were receiving only 125 grams per day, you see, and a lot of people died just from starvation and children. And uh, there is a, a very, very big, uh, beautiful cemetery in St. Petersburg. It is called Piskarov Memorial Cemetery, and uh, all of them are just buried there. And nobody knows where exactly the, the, the burial place of his particular relative.
is there. But, well. Yes, 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 motherland, yes, that's it. So, and, well, we, we uh, you know, uh, by, by nature, I think so, Russians uh, really are, are not, not, uh, not eager to have some, some kind of contradictions uh, with uh, other nations, and the main idea is really to live in peace and uh, well, to, to have normal conditions of, uh, of life and, and development and so on. But it happens so. I think we are the only country in the world that was uh, defending uh, its own uh, country for such uh, a big, uh, a big, uh, big, uh, for such a big period uh, within uh, the, the, the history. Well, and uh, maybe, maybe that's why we are not that much developed, because we are reconstructing and reconstructing and trying, uh, you know, to, to, to come to a uh, normal again uh, level of living after all these problems, uh, war problems and, and so on. Well, it depends. Some more questions, yeah. Would you say that that is one of those um, kind of esoteric problems that Russia has is that it bears a history, the burden of history. Maybe it's a burden of history. Maybe it's a burden of history also. Of course, it's not an excuse. No. Definitely, it's not an excuse. But but uh, I think one one of the explanations it could be that's a burden of history. Yes, that's. Yeah. As you were saying earlier, one of the problems that you encountered was the fact that reforms came from above. But that is your history. That's our that history. All the well, way back to, yes. Uh, Ivan the Great, Ivan yes. Grozny, Ivan yes. Ivan yes, 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 yes. And another thing is that, you know, uh, Russian people are uh, always uh, very, very big believers. And they are always very, and we, uh, we were always very tolerant, and we were always very patient. And, uh, well, uh, I was uh, saying today that we are having strikes now in the enterprises, and it was a great surprise for Mrs. Anderson to hear that we are having strikes, uh, because we were really very, very patient with all our problems. You know, we were not going and not demanding something, and uh, well, we were just waiting and 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 hoping, you see, for for better life and for better future and and so on and so forth. So and uh, it was always we were believing to the Tsar, and in our poetry, Russian poetry, for instance, uh, there is wonderful, our, I think, piece and. Uh, um, it is by by Nikrasov, and I think you 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 know this uh, poet. And uh, there is in his one of his uh, poems, "Vod приедет барин, барин нас рассудит." So that means that the uh, the owner or the landlord will come, and he will uh, settle all our problems. You see, so we were believing always that somebody will come and settle all our problems. You see, and it is still in our uh, soul and in our nature that we are believing on somebody on the top, and the president, for instance, that he is really understanding what is going on, and he will have the solutions for all the problems. But it's not always like that. You see, so yeah, that. Bush. Oh, <laughs> you all. Well, yeah, but you know, uh, here, for instance, now I also are uh, observing the uh, the these political debates on the television. You see, and uh, well, it's quite funny, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> and it's very very interesting. You see, and uh, to to pick up the the similarities uh, because uh, I think they are not that different in different countries. They're pretty, <laughs> pretty the same, because we were uh, having these elections to our state Duma, yes, and they did it yesterday. Uh, they had the elections, and before that there was also a lot of debates on the television, and now we all have the elections of the president also, and they will start again, all, also these debates, and 
they are really pretty similar as you you are having here and well i think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, the the uh, the peculiarity of 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 political games it's uh, more or less the same everywhere yes but you are having only two parties but we are having 11 and uh, the four parties succeed to go to the Duma, four from 11. But still four, not two. You see? Then the struggle is more intensive, <laughs> so to speak. Well. Well, we want to thank Dr. Kolesnikov for coming today. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to give her a little bit of a break before she speaks again at 3.30 on the Starbucks case. <coughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Thank you.